Secret Service taking no questions about the Trump assassination attempt or questions as to why RFK Jr. was left hanging on the line? Media pushback? Hardly. The assembled press corps licks its collective loins like a docile dog. It's obvious, is it not? At all levels across the nation, too many employed in government and media are intellectually, ethically, and physically unfit. They don't live in the real world, but they talk shit like they do. They pretend to be speaking for you, but all they do is spread hot coals, hot takes, and dumb shittery. This country club of phonies couldn't locate the public square if you gave them 300 bucks to catch an Uber. <laughs> they need to be dumped at the local bus depot. Live from downtown Detroit is the No Bullshit News Hour with my main man, Charlie LaDuff and Jared Newman. Na 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 na. No bullshit! Just breaking news. Double or bullshit. Double or bullshit. I need some prominent display or presentation in that introduction. I feel kind of like an afterthought. Oh yeah, Karen. <laughs> And Karen Dumbass <laughs> with Charlie LaDouche. <laughs> All right, look, uh, for a little broken down Midwestern podcast, we bring it, we bring you to biz. We're broken down? Yeah, you know, I mean, we're just trying to be self deprecating. Okay. Know, you know what I mean? Everybody knows. Everybody knows. Okay, this is how you know. Assassination attempt on Trump this past weekend. Uh, what do we know about it? We're, over, we're not in Pennsylvania. Here's what we know about it. We have Gary Byrne joining us. Gary is uh, the runaway New York Times bestseller, former Secret Service agent, the body man to Papa Bush and the Clintons. Runaway bestselling book, came out in 2016. Crisis of Character, a White House Secret Service officer discloses his firsthand experience with Hillary Bill and how they operate. Then, as a follow up in 2019, Secrets of the Secret Service. So there's no better guy to go through what happened last weekend and what the fuck is going on in Washington and why nothing works. Gary, man, thanks for being on, brother. Thank you, glad to be here. All right, so you were, you were, I didn't even know how to get into this. Okay, <laughs> Mark, get, get us into this. Oh, okay, it'll go on me? Yeah. Well, I mean, we saw a horrific event on, on Saturday, the attempted assassination of a president you never cut, cut 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 we'll take that up well, post i want to know what happened yeah what happened everybody well, not but, but that's a question what did happen because at first you know you saw a secret service it seemed to kind of converge and respond in the way that you would anticipate them to do and then everybody start picking it apart why did they not see the person on the roof what happened were, were the ladies that were protecting him were they adequately prepared so let's ask gary Go ahead, what gary. happened uh uh, why is a five foot four woman assigned? Why is there not a sniper on a slope roof? Take it away. What the fuck happened, brother? So, so what you saw, what you saw on uh, on that Saturday when President Trump almost or Donald Trump almost got murdered in front of us was the culmination of years and years of of what happens to a government agency. The Secret Service has an important job, and when we first, I was in the uniform division. Me and everybody else, agents, officers, technicians, clerks, when you join, you're a good person. You want to do the right thing. You want to protect these people. You want to secure our financial. You want to stop counterfeiting. But the problem is, is you're in a government agency that's got all the problems of the IRS and the Secret Service. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the, first, the second book, Secrets of the Secret Service, was to show people that this something disastrous is going to happen. Now, I didn't predict what was going to happen on Saturday, but I certainly lead you down the path that this is a big possibility and it almost happened. So what you were looking at is, is a detail that was undermanned, grossly undermanned. The counter sniper guys were only dedicated to that detail the day before. They normally need more than 24 hours to do a site survey. Now, they, they had no response. Each counter sniper team, the way it's set up, um, is they usually have two response people on the radio. The, these response people work together as a team. Hey, I see this. 
you know, um, for instance, that Saturday, um, the podium, the podium that Donald Trump was talking from would be called 12 o'clock. Picture a clock face in your in your head. The podium's 12 o'clock. So if I'm the counter sniper guy and I'm trying to tell you that I see something, I use the face of the clock. So the podium's 12 o'clock, go to your three o'clock and behind that car, there's a dude bending down doing something, you know, and then they go over and they look. So that's how it works. Uh, they didn't have the proper response. It's not unusual and it's fine if one of the response people is from the Secret Service, whether it's an agent or an officer, and then one is local police. That's even better because the local pol local police officer has a local connection, right? And can tell you, hey, that's that guy's fine. You know, he lives here. He, he lives in the gutter, whatever, you know. And so, um, so that's the way it's supposed to work. They were grossly undermanned um, and... Clearly, the Secret Service, uh, in my opinion, based on what I've learned since then and what I knew before that, the Secret Service director is was bowing to pressure to to reduce the Donald Trump's Secret Service footprint. The, the, um, I know for a fact that at least twice the head of Trump's detail requested more security, more counter sniper, more canine, and they've been denied. That doesn't normally happen like that. But the problem is, is that the agency is so um, is so over uh, undermanned. Um, excuse me, it's so undermanned. I talk about this in, in Secrets of the Secret Service. The Secret Service mentality is: if I'm setting up a detail and I and I say, and just just for one part of the detail, the metal detectors, the uniform division guys and girl women do the metal detectors. You're going to need a uh, you're going to need a um, hundred officers for the metal detector. So we can have 10 or 15 metal detectors. The Secret Service will give you, at best, 60% of that manpower. And it's not the way to do it because they, they routinely, and I talk about this extensively in both books, they routinely work their workforce to death. Um, years ago, just to get, and I don't wanna to get too sidetracked, but just to give you an idea, years ago when I worked at the training center, an agent retired. And he went on, to, before we had email, we used to use a telex machine. He went on the Secret Service telex and just berated the administration, the, the Secret Service director and everybody for the way they treated the uniform division, the agents. And at the end of his, his manifesto, he said, the Secret Service director's office has adopted the Cherokee Indian mentality. They <laughs> rode their horses until they died and then they ate them. And that's how they treat their employees. So that kind of tells you what you need to know. Now, back, go back to that, that day uh, where President Trump was almost murdered in front of everybody. There were mistakes made. Um, and, and in today's society, you can't tell somebody because they're only five feet tall um, that they can't be on a detail. And, and even if you did, again, go back to what I said before, they're so starved for manpower that they, it doesn't matter how tall you are. They have to have the bodies and they didn't have enough bodies. They didn't have enough tall bodies. Um, but what you saw was pretty good procedure. The shots rang out. President Trump had the best first reaction. He dropped, you know, you saw him grab his ear because he got nicked, you know, a quarter of an inch. If he had turned his head a quarter of an inch, this would be a whole different discussion. You know, and his family would have watched him die. But luckily, <clears throat> that didn't happen. So... You know, he goes down, he's holding his ear, they're on top of him. They're covering him. It's called shelter in place. They're, they're waiting to be told that the threat has been neutralized so they can move to the best place they can move at the time is in a straight line, as straight as possible to the limousine, which is a hardened vehicle. Uh, I try not to call anything bulletproof. Nothing, everything that you shoot a gun at eventually deteriorates. So the, the, the Suburban is bullet resistant. Um, they're going to move to that. And the, the, does it look like it takes a lot of time? Yeah, it might to you, but they're doing different things at the same time. They're checking each other. They're checking the president. They're communicating. You can hear them because one of the news agencies had a mic on them. And you could hear them making their radio calls. And yes, they sound very excited. They had an enormous adrenaline dump. Donald Trump had an enorm, enormous adrenaline dump. Everybody there did because everybody there was technically a target. And what they don't know at the time is somebody died already and two people were grievously wounded, but they have to focus on President on Donald Trump. So they're checking him out. Um, 
his shoes fall off. They have to get his shoes back on. And he wants to let everybody know he's, he's okay. So he puts his fist up. He's trying to be defiant. I, I, actually, let me change that. He's not trying to be defiant. He's just Donald Trump, you know. And so, and then they go to move to the car. And you see, right before they move, you see two guys in black uniforms. That's Secret Service agents. That's the counter-assault team. They're doing exactly what they were trained to do. They're covering from where they are a couple feet away. When they're ready to move, they come up, one in the front, one in the back. And there was a third guy from the local sheriff's department or police department, which was fine. He was down off the stage. He wasn't in their way. And he was helping cover the backside. And he just did that by instinct. He never trained with these guys. And so they moved to the car. So when they go to get him in the car, President Trump basically, you know, reminds everybody that he's not the easiest guy to protect or Donald Trump, excuse me, not the easiest guy to protect. So they're trying to get him in the car. The, some of the agents are still checking his body. You know, they, we, we, everybody, it's ingrained to you what happened to Ronald Reagan. They thought Ronald Reagan was fine. He was complaining to Jerry Parr that Jerry broke his ribs on the transmission hump. And then after about a minute and a half in the limo on the way to the White House, a spot of blood showed up on Reagan's lip. And Jerry Parr asked him another question and two spots of blood showed up. And he yelled at the agent driving the car. They spun that giant monster around and went right to GW. And uh, Ronald Reagan was bleeding out as they, you know, in the car and they didn't know it. Well, Mark, so that's put, why put, put that picture back up. You just had up there. This is when he's getting into the suburban pause. Right. Now I'm looking, I'm looking at the female agents and look, I mean, there's plenty of uh, tall, yeah. nimble, yeah, women qualified to do it. And I'm sure they're qualified, but I for that they're a foot shorter than the guy number one. Well, N he, number he steps two up on the boarding board. Well, I, I know, I know, but I'm when they're taking him off stage. They're still short. one of the agents bends over to pick up his hat, just yeah. exposing the guy. Portrait. Yeah. Another of these agents can't holster her weapon. To me, okay. I was watching in real time. I'm like, the training's not there. No. So, so again, this, this goes back to the adrenaline dump. And also, too, you have to realize, and we found this out since this happened, that's not his regular detail. Some of these people are from other field offices. Now, don't get wow. me wrong. They've all had the training. And this is the way that this is one of the problems with the Secret Service that I point out in Secrets of the Secret Service. Years ago, they decided not to divide the agents who do investigations into the counterfeit and other things and the, and the, and the protection agents they need other than the president's actual detail. So now they're, they're in this town in Pennsylvania. These agents come from all different field office. For some reason, the director of the Secret Service sometime before put most of Donald Trump's regular agents on a Jill Biden or, Jill Biden or some other detail. And these people were temps. And that, that doesn't, that it doesn't have to be sinister. It could just be a, a bad decision based on the fact that they're, again, every part of the service is starved for manpower. Well, a bad decision means you go. Life or death. Okay, so uh, what? Uh, Kim Cheadle, do you know her? She had 27 yeah, years. Uh, no, no. She, she came from outside. Um, she's, she's there because she's a friend of Jill Biden's. <laughs> so, That's how she got the job. Um, she was an executive. She was an executive protection person for a company that that uh, did security for the Pepsi company, and um, she may have had some experiences before that. Um, but um, she was she was the Secret Service inside. My, the people that have talked to me from inside the Secret Service, it, and a couple of them are actually women, and and they say, listen, she was just a diversity hire, and they're trying to break that that male secret service, you know, if you don't, if you can't do this job as a director, if you haven't lived, risked your life to protect them. And, and I, I, honestly, I believe that's sort of true. Um, and, and here's a good example. She tried to make the argument that the roof was too, too, uh, Slanted, angled, sloped, right? Yes. She, she has no idea what the counter sniper guys go through before they're even told they can't have the job. You would not believe the fitness test and the stuff these guys have to do. It is incredible. And by the time they pass their first part of shooting, which takes like four weeks, or excuse me, two weeks, and th they're only allowed to drop a bullet outside a quarter size target. They're only using a 22, 25 yards, strapped in a leather shooting jacket. 
Um, you drop one round outside the quarter size target. That's it. Put the rifle down. Don't say a word to us. Go to your last duty station. Have a nice day. That's Gary, it. let me ask you this. Early, when you first started talking, you said that the that the Secret Service was like other government agencies, including the IRS, and you named In what way? Like, what is that common thread between all the agencies that appear, uh, that obviously, you. it's what? Thank you so much for asking it that way. It's bloated. It's bloated with money. Uh, the, the, they do everything about getting a larger budget to have nicer offices and bigger things and and they function poorly. They they have so many levels of of management. You have the director, you have a deputy director. Then you have at least when I left, there were at least 14 assistant deputy directors. And then you have every office has a special agent. Every field office around the world has a special agent in charge. And then there's a deputy special agent in charge. And then there's there's they keep expanding the management and not expanding the worker force. And then they took over the uniform division. I was in the uniform division, which was a regular police force. When they took over more control of the uniform division, they broke it up into smaller parts so they could put agents in charge and make more jobs. And they it can't get stuff done. It is mm -hmm. it got it was very bad when I got there, when when I was there as I was leaving in 2003. And since then, it got very bad. And then after 9-11, I transferred over to the air marshals. And 90% of the management for the new air marshal program came from the old Secret Service. So I sort of jumped out of the fire pan into the fire. But these managers and supervisors don't get on the airplane with you because it's dangerous. Well, we, have a real, so I, we have a real sickness. I think this, this shows it and playing off what you just said about government and its ineptitude. I mean, you can look at... The Department of Transportation. Mm -hmm. What did we find out about East Palestine? That the railroad was lying and they didn't mm -hmm. have to light those cars on fire. What does the Secretary of Transportation do? Nothing. You look no. at the withdrawal from mm -hmm. Afghanistan. You look at the Secretary of Defense. He goes AWOL. You look at our Secretary of State and the war is all over the place. You look at the Secretary of Treasury and the money's devalued. It's, it's just become a culture of incompetence. Would you? Because you spent a career in there, Gary. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And, and to, just to give you an idea of... Oh, let me jump in. And this director, that's why you need to go because you won't answer questions and the press and the TV, you, you accept these answers that mm -hmm. aren't, aren't answers at all. And what it leaves to us, Gary, regular people who don't want to be conspiracy theorists, but you won't answer the question. What do you mean that roof is not in your ring of responsibility? You know, that was crazy right? to me. Yeah, I right. mean, because it wasn't right. that far and I just and that made no sense to me, but it's, it is about government and government is just more process, which is an impediment to any progress. I mean, they everything is too process laden and to address that, they add more process to it. And political. And political. Because we had uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. sitting right here on this program. He never got Secret Service an outrage. And he said it on air. He goes, it's because they want to bleed me of a half a million to a million dollars a month for my own security. So I'm not a political threat. So we threaten everybody's lives. I, th yeah. Does she have to go? Well, here, here's the thing. Yes, she has to go, but but also part of me says they should make her stay and make her try to fix some of this. But the problem is, is she's she's so in over her head. She to make the statement she did about the angle of the roof. You don't have a clue who these guys are. These guys, I just can't tell you. I don't want to go into it now unless, until you're ready. But um, I want I wanted to well, mention let me do one this, thing. Gary. Let me do this because not everybody. Sure. consumes all this we do have that clip right so it's it's abc news asking her about this and there's no follow-up so let, let's play the clip of uh kim Cheadle, the director of the secret service as to why there weren't our guys on that roof that building in particular has a, a sloped roof uh at its highest point um and so you know there's a safety factor that would be con considered there that we wouldn't want to put somebody up on a sloped roof uh, and so, you know, the decision was made to secure the building uh, from inside. That's stupid. That's completely made up. That's Nobody stupid. told her that. And if they did, if they did, it was somebody who's been in the Secret Service for a lifetime and they don't like her. And they said, watch this. <laughs> they set her up. Hey, here, director, here's, here's why they, we didn't put him up there. You know, That's... listen, when these guys, 
these guys, you know, I say, I say guys, to my knowledge, there's never been a, a woman on counter sniper, not because they haven't been allowed to try out, but because it's so physically demanding. Now you see that picture. Now imagine all that equipment on all that equipment in a backpack on your back and you're climbing up a one foot wide metal ladder in the arena and pick the city in the United States, mm -hmm. you know, 250 feet up this ladder to get to the scaffolding that is covered in bat and bird shit. And nobody has been up there for years. It's in, in, in and it's inside or it could be outside for her to, these guys, they're repellers. They learn to be climbers that they, they, again, like I described to you, their first shooting experiment to find out if they could do this job is shooting a 22 at 25 yards on an indoor range at a quarter size target. And if they drop one bullet out of that circle, that's it. Put the rifle down, clear it, have a nice day. Don't say a word to the instructors. So as, Go as, back. To the as the director, does she require any of this, or is this just strictly an administrative? No, this is, okay, this is so what she came into. So she's yeah. she's charged with overseeing, managing, and executing a strategy of people that she has no idea what they do. She, she, that's exactly right. You said it perfectly. She Put has no clue back of who she's managing. She doesn't know. And, now, look, and Gary, Gary, here. Yeah. Go ahead. The picture, it's an iconic picture. It's the two uh, yeah. counter snipers, right? Secret right. Service up on right. the roof with all the gear. Right. They're on a roof that's it more like more inclined <laughs> than the roof they left unprotected. You're an idiot. You know what this woman sounds like? Dana Nessel. And close, <laughs> have you close my eyes. It sounds just like the Attorney General. But, have but you ever you seen the roof of the White House? <laughs> yeah. I've been up there. It, it was when I got there in 1990 and they took us for a tour up there. Um, it was in such bad condition as far as anybody working up there. And, and nobody gives a crap about the Secret Service. Those guys that, <laughs> you know, I mean, like we were under the tre The Secret Service was under the Treasury Department at the time. And, and you know, day to day working that, you know, hey, I'm standing outside on the roof of the White House during a lightning storm. OK, well, you should be careful. <laughs> you know, so, you know, so eventually they put a, a police booth up there. You can see it in some shots. It looks like a, a small phone booth. And it's got bullet resistant glass in it. And, and um, but there was no place to actually walk safely. So they put up these small catwalks. But don't get me wrong. It's not, you know, it's still rickety and metal. And but it's much better than what it was. And um, and I, I know I've been up on the roof a lot because when I was stationed at the White House, I had when you when you um, work outside the Oval Office, your, your top secu top secret security clearance actually gets elevated up to code word because of what I described to you before, as far as you know, seeing plans and material and and information that the president uh, might look at, you have to secure sometimes. So anyway, um, then that allows you to do these classified um, uh, escorts of of people doing certain things around the complex. And I escorted the, the guy that was surveying the roof to replace the roof on the White House. So I was up there for, you know, a whole week on and off. And so I, I, I know it really well. And when she said that, I was like, she's never been on the roof of the White House. You don't have a clue what she's saying. That was just an or, elementary response. Like it just oh it, it, it sounded as though she didn't even she didn't even make up anything a, a good excuse. Like that's not that's a very that's something that a kid would say, in my opinion. And, and you know, Gary's right. Like. This is this whole administration everywhere in the country now, from Lansing mm -hmm. to Detroit, to the, it's all talking points. Yeah. So is. somebody prepped her with that, and either they're yeah. idiots or they were trying to get rid well, of her. They, they prepped her with that on purpose, if you ask me. Because when she said that, I'm like, oh my god, this is like Saturday Night Live. It's you know, it's sad. So let's wrap it up in this way. Sure. Now we're gonna have a really hot political cycle, like. Things are mm -hmm. inflamed and, and, and distracted. Right. And now Bobby Kennedy, now he just mm -hmm. got some momentum. He's got, what's the Secret Service going to do, Gary? Obviously, there's issues there. There's training issues. There's strategy issues. Um, are they going to be able to get a hold of this and, and safely operate? Or is this across our fingers and hope nothing happens? No, not really. But but here's the thing. You only not, know not how really bad what? They are. You, you only know how bad they are and how stressed they are for manpower. And how, because they're so stressed for manpower that the training that they're supposed to get every month they haven't had in a year, you only know that when something happens like it did to President to the Donald Trump. And, and because the, one of the best things the Secret Service does is, is hide behind the name and protect the reputation of the Secret Service. Mm 
Hmm. That's what they do best. And, um, and, and I go into this in great detail in the second book, Secrets of the Secret Service. But setting that aside, I, I wanted to talk about um, Robert Kennedy for a minute, if I could. Please. So, and, and I know everybody realizes this, but I wanted to frame it up like this. There is a law that says, and there's a group of people who meet and decide who a viable candidate is. And the reason that law and those people exist is because somebody killed his father in a, in a hotel kitchen. And then to deny him that security because you're the president of the United States and he's saying things you don't like, I'm sorry. You can set aside all the other crap that the Bidens are accused of doing and the laptop and all that, and you, he should be going after for just that and be removed yeah. from office. You cannot sacrifice somebody's life because you don't like their opinion. It's insane. Agreed. But that's where we are as a country. Yes, I mean, it is. That's, that's literally where we are. It's it is. all it's, it's all about if, if we don't like what someone says, if we don't like them and using what tools you have access to to eliminate or at least reduce your competition. And to me, that's what that's what that was. Yeah, you're a, you're 100 percent right. Can, can, and, I, can I ask you this question? I know you were criticized for writing the book, saying that you did it for political purposes. Right. I, why did you write the book? The first book, uh, right. Crisis of Character, Crisis of the yeah. White House Secret Service officer, yeah. discloses his firsthand experience with Hillary, Bill, and how they operate. So so I, I figured she was going to run. When I, um, somebody came to me and said, hey, well, I want you to write your life story. It was about 2013. I was still working as I had transferred over to the air marshal program. I was getting close to retiring. I told them no, to make a long story short, we ended up deciding to do it. And um, the caveats were, I have I have 100% say on what goes in there. Um, 20 years later, I'm not burning everybody to the ground that I didn't like. There were people that that worked for the Clintons that were complete morons and, and treated me like shit. But 20 George years Stephanopoulos. Later, yeah, well, uh, yeah, well, I, yeah. So, Charlie. Good example, sort of. But um, so anyway, there were Secret Service employees who made, who were having affairs and stuff. And, and I told some of the stories, but I, I changed their names. And I said I changed their names. And here's why I wrote the book. Vote for Hillary Clinton. Don't vote for her. But, but have a better understanding of who she really is. If you can't consider my experiences, I took a polygraph test to get there. I, 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 every day that somebody in the uniform division or an agent um, – goes to work, they're risking their life to protect these people that that half the country loves and half the country hates. So um, if you can't consider what I had to say of who she really is and what her character is, then you want to just stay in your little narrative, and that's fine. But here's what the truth is. Here's what happened to me. One of the things you have to realize, in the very beginning when we started getting subpoenaed and there was about 24 of us, Somebody in the Clinton administration decided that they could blame two of the people in the Secret Service Uniform Division, myself and somebody else, for Monica Lewinsky being in the West Wing. They were going to try to accuse us of having the affair with her. Uh, wow. Think, and I think, I think it's important to say here about Gary's background that's how they were. that when they, they wanted to pull him in front of a grand jury, tell us what you know about Monica Lewinsky, Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. And he's Gary's an ethical dude. He's he's a real dude. So people can say what they what they always do. But Gary refused to do it, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and they threatened to jail him if he didn't do it. Okay, yeah. so th there's that. Th th this yeah. is intriguing, Charlie. I mean, this is probably one of the more intriguing conversations we've had. I have to ask you this too: What well, made you think that you would be suicided by the Clintons for well, coming so, forward? So my first experience with the Clinton machine was when George H.W. Bush was still president. It was towards the end of his, I started in 1991 with him, it was towards the end of his uh, time as president. And well, he was r running against, getting ready to run against Bill Clinton and it hadn't been officially announced. Anyway, George W. Bush is in the edge of, of uh, Tennessee, right by Arkansas. And he's visiting some friends and we're in this, and the funny thing is, is I was there less than two years later with Bill Clinton in the same place. So. He's in this restaurant meeting with some local politicians, George H.W. Bush. Wow, They're wow. eating barbecue and the whole area is secured. <laughs> and I'm standing on the corner across from the restaurant with this. Uh, there's a couple Secret Service agents spread out. Um, there's counter sniper up on the roof of a couple of buildings. It's a small one level town. Um, there's all these people standing, you know, back 
where we put up the rope lines, watching them eat through the glass, you know, from a distance. And, and so I'm with this Arkansas sheriff and he has a car and I've been standing for about five hours. And I said, Hey, can I sit down in this car for a minute? And he goes, yeah, of course. And I said, listen, if I fall asleep, kick me, don't let me fall asleep. Somebody will take a picture of me, you know, anyway. So I'm sitting in the car and I'm reading his newspaper and it's this local newspaper about this Arkansas, Southern Arkansas governor who looks like he's going to run against George Bush. And it's all this scandal, Paul Flowers and scandal of rumors about running drugs. And he's, he's the CIA operative and all this crazy stuff. And I'm reading this and, you know, and so when I get out of the car, I said, hey, I was looking at your paper and I said, there's no way that your boy is going to ever become president. And he looked at me like he was looking through me. He said, Gary, I'm going to tell you something believe everything you hear about these people. He said, my daddy grew up with Bill Clinton's mother. And he said, I'm telling you right now, uh, everything you believe you hear about these people, believe it. And the crazy it is, the more likely it's true. And that never left my mind. I mean, that guy, I never saw that guy again. You know, we went on with our lives, but his severity, it would be like a doctor saying, Hey, you cut your foot a week ago. And you have a bad staph infection. You know, like I, it rung a bell in me. And uh, so anyway, um, so I always kept that in the back of my mind. And, um, and so when, when I had got subpoenaed and, you know, in the meantime, there had been all these stories coming out uh, from the Arkansas State Police and other people. And as time went by, every one of them ended up being true. And, you know, there was the story about this guy that was supposedly helping Bill Clinton um, – run drugs or something when he was the governor of Arkansas and he was a friend of theirs. And then he, uh, the FBI supposedly flipped him, and then they found him on the side of the road in a car. And they said he'd been run off the road by accident, but he had two bullet holes in the back of his head. So the joke became, you know, one car Arkansas suicide. So yes, I, and so did my coworkers, like, um, you know, they were always legitimate threat. Yeah. Well, I was afraid it could be. So I took some precautions, um, I contacted a friend of mine who had been a lawyer for the CIA at one time and um, and his firm represented me pro bono um, and nobody knew about it. I had no legal obligation to tell anybody else that uh, I had other representation. So just, I was wow. scripted. Okay, so we got to talk to him again, like after, I mean, just first of all, I'm going to order both of your books because uh, I'm you. now I'm extremely intrigued. But one key takeaway, especially as we enter into this election season that I think everybody should listen to, it's not if, if you're going to support somebody or criticize or not support somebody, do it in its entirety in an honest capacity. And I say that about Joe Biden and you know everybody's like, oh, he doesn't look at the whole person and look at who they are. If you still want to support them, that's fine. But do it honestly and do it objectively. And that's what people don't want to do. They want to dismiss the things that would otherwise be critical or negative about the people that they support. If you're going to support them, support them in their in their in, in comprehensively. And I'm going to be snobby about it. I'm going to be snobby. <laughs> I get one vote. Everybody else gets one vote. Can you do me a favor and do some fucking work? And now that's just how I feel. That's yeah, that's, that's really not working for my neighborhood, and it's not working for my city. It's not working for this country. It's your right to do what you want, but come on, do some work. Look at everything. We don't make them, Charlie. And they just kick the can and keep it going. Oh, uh, my daughter and I are co-writing a, a piece, like Prospects okay. of Bobby Kennedy, her viewpoint of Bobby Kennedy, and my viewpoint of my daughter, what, what, I, what, mm-hmm. what I think my daughter is. And then my daughter writes back, no, this is who I am. Oh, that's good. So it's a father wondering about his daughter, the daughter looking at dad, that's what you think about me, and, and, and this is what I think in life. So it, it's cool. That. And I'm, it's, she's a great writer. I think there could Wonder be a, she got there could be a career there, and I, I was like was really proud of what I saw. So I'm glad mine's doing that. That's good. And I would hope that everybody would encourage their kids to do it, and for people to serve and do it honorably and tell the truth. Like Gary Byrne, best-selling author, former Secret Service. Gary, you will come back. Sure, anytime. Because okay. what I'm hearing here is the Secret Service is fucked up. It, <laughs> it can't be fixed in the short term. And now this wasn't a one-off. You got a pretty good look at what goes on underneath the sheets. And DEI yeah. hires aren't just about race. If you're saying that this, it, it's, it's about friendship, it's about white women, it's about people that don't, that, that you're filling, you're checking a box without determining whether or not those qualifications exist. Cause this lady is proof positive. Well, Ed, look, watch this. A DEI hire, like you can be competent. 
right? That's true. Like that's true. I'm not saying Kamala Harris is competent, mm-hmm. but she's got the resume, right? Or you look at, uh, you just look at a lot of people. Everybody has a resume, Charlie. Well, that that that's what makes. I mean, you can people write resumes. I could I could make myself sound like the most intelligent, experienced person in the world until you get in the room and the proof is maybe a, bit, a little I didn't different. Wa- I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> well, gee, Charlie, thank you. <laughs> Hey, can I, can I make a comment about something? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I got a little distracted earlier, but we were talking about the video and when uh, trying to put uh, Donald Trump into the uh, armored uh, suburban and um, the secret service agent, the f- woman's trying to holster her gun. So yeah, thank you. So she's dealing with a massive adrenaline dump. I started to say that, but the other thing too is she might not routinely always wear body armor and you can see she's got it on. It pushes the holster out of the way. Yes. What you see her struggling with, I'm not concerned. She held onto the gun. She's still looking. You know, this, this again, this is the difference between real life and what we see in movies and TV. Right. And, and does everybody there and need some more, tra- you know, need tra- uh, continuous training? Sure they do. That, 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 that We've proved that, you know, thousands of years ago, you know. And uh, so, but, but because they're so poorly managed and there's so little manpower, they're not getting the training that they need. Um, that was was better than it could have been. I mean, it could have been worse than what you saw. Um, so I sort of knock on wood at times. And, well, we and have been scenarios. Like, Might as put, well rewind that a second. Okay, that's true. Her sunglasses, like yeah, sunglasses, like it went around all like chicken. Yeah, it's a nervous. Of, right. Okay, uh, it's a nervous chick. Okay, yeah, but you don't look, have time look, for look, that. Look, 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 look at the. The, the the men yes. to her right, the one in the uniform with his weapon and the other Secret Service agent, yeah. calm, collected, yeah. commanding the crowd, eyes up, well, tall. But, 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 tall. But, but, but let's not let's not say that women are emotional. I mean, that's that's, 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 that's a that's, that's a blessing and a curse. I, I get that. No. Um, right. But I think that, as Gary pointed out, you there, there's a level of training and preparation that has to exist. So if you're able to do that within the confines of who you are, your height, your gender, more power to you. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm listening to Kimberly Cheadle, the that was the director of the Secret yeah. Service, saying, you know, by the end of the decade, we want we want this to be 30 percent women. Why? How about 30 yeah. percent more effective? Yeah, but people and, get and go record that, though, like darling. there's a lot of, like collegiate athletes not everybody makes it to the WNBA right these are top notch Mm -hmm. right tall really (laughs) nimble people do it no you couldn't do it damn no you couldn't do why not go recruit them why not pay agents better everybody else getting paid better and give them the training Gary said they probably haven't been had the regular training over the years when I was in the Secret Service and especially when I was at the training center the Secret Service does naturally get um broken athletes a lot of broken athletes men and women big giant football players that were you know that fraction of a second too slow or they had gotten into the nfl or or the major league baseball or or even basketball and then you know they twisted the ankle and that was it and or the knee and and so and i'm just saying this kind of humorously we had our when i was there there was a lot of big dude and i'm a big guy i'm six two but I was never like a, a borderline professional athlete. Um, but th- we did, they do get their share of those uh, of type people. And, uh, um, and they're usually the funniest people to train because they're so frigging athletic that you almost have to rein them in a little bit. <laughs> Something to prove. So you think I could try out for the Secret Service? No. Okay. Well, yeah. There's a, there's like there's like Gary jobs. was saying, there's a lot of desk jobs. <laughs> and, <laughs> and apparently maybe, you're, maybe, you're maybe, as qualified hey, as tell, the director. But I'll tell you one thing. I could be the director. I guarantee you that. I, I that I guarantee you, and I can shoot. So I get you know two things. <laughs> All right, yeah. uh, Gary Byrne. Hey, thanks so much for, for being on, brother. My pleasure. Really do. Thank you. Now what we'll do Thank is you. word from our sponsors. American Coney Island. So good, even Al Roker from the Today Show eats here. Not like that other guy, Al Joker, who eats at Lafayette. So make sure you're a Roker and not a Joker. American Coney Island.
Well, you know, when it rains, the power goes out. And when the power goes out, the internet goes out. When the internet goes out, I call my friend Matt and Bernie at XG Service Group. Look at Bernie here on his hands and knees, giving it everything he's got. Look at that man crack. So busy. He forgot to wear a belt. There's Matt right there getting the board together. That's 734-245-4100 if you need Matt and Bernie to come take care of your voice over internet, your security cameras, off-campus access control, Wi-Fi and cameras for homes and business. They'll design it for you. You got restaurants, they do drive through systems, railroad cameras for public safety, total wireless camera systems for your home and business. Yeah, that's right. Call XG Services at 734-245-4100. Okay, uh, Gary, pick up your pen. Listen what I got to tell you here. The politicians lie to you. The media lies to you. So how do you know if your investment statements are lying to you? Remember, you're not managing your wealth, Gary. That's some unseen guy working for a big bank, jockeying some unknown algorithm, but he's not making decisions based on what's best for you, Gary. He's making decisions on what's best for his bonus, gambling with your hard-earned dollars. So you should know your money, man. And you don't have a money, man. I know you don't. Pick up the pen. He may. That's. Would you not get that money in the pen? I hear you. Oh, he, he needs a better one. And he's okay. ringing it down. Yeah, look, right, at the, look at the shabby office back there. Gary could use a couple of bucks. What can we use here? <laughs> look, that's why I work with financial specialist Luke Nowacki at Pinnacle Wealth Strategies. He'll tailor a financial plan, plan specifically for you, Gary. From annuities to retirement accounts to college savings, the whole nine. He'll keep you up to date, and he's always a phone call away. Let Luke Nowacki worry so you don't have to. Luke Nowacki, ready? 248-663-4748. Right, read, read that back to me. Uh, 663-4748. What's the area code? Uh, I didn't get it. Go give it to me again. 248. And it's Luke Nowacki. Dude, and do me a favor, because he would love to talk to you. You're going to love this guy. Will you do me that favor? Will you give Luke a call today? Yeah, I'll see. Well, not today. Yeah, I will will later. I mean, he he just like he likes to talk about the things you're into. Let me just put it like that. And it would be and it would be cool. I think he would like that. Luke Nowacki at Pinnacle Well Strategies. All right. (laughs) So let me tell you, we've been there is a murder trial in, in Detroit. Do you remember? When Hamas jumped into Israel and slaughtered 1,400 people. You remember that, Gary, right? There was a murder of a Jewish leader here in Detroit at that, two weeks later. Samantha Wall. Yeah. You might have heard of it. Because yeah. everybody thought, ooh, it might be Hamas. We're going to you know, look for the Arab angle here. There wasn't one. Then one of her lovers calls the police a couple weeks later and confesses to it. Did you hear about this? I did. Okay. And then... They let him go. He lawyers up. And then they start doing the videotape. And it's like a Jesse Smollett type of shit. And they find a black burglar guy. Right? Good suspect. His phone's in the area. And he's got two drops of blood of hers on his arm. So, obviously, you know the case. There's a lot of, like, reasonable doubt in this thing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to wonder why the prosecutor brought it. And... Had to. I was in the hallway. The jury's right now is, is hung, and the judge mm-hmm. is trying to encourage him to stay with it. The family came up to me in the hallway, and they listened to the podcast, and they're hurting. And sure. remember, my my sister was killed at Brightmore. Mm-hmm. I, I feel it. Sure. And they're like, "You might have got a few things wrong." I go, "Well, l- let's correct that. What mm-hmm. did we get wrong?" And they're like, "There was a picture." of a white guy leaving the parking lot, right? Earlier in the night Mm -hmm. that the police never tracked where he went. Right. Right. And the defense attorneys blew up the picture and it's a guy with with a a beard, Mm -hmm. a George Michael haircut, dark glasses and a jacket. And the defense attorney put a picture Mm -hmm. next to it of of the boyfriend boyfriend, and it looks exactly alike. But the family said that picture's false. He just put it in there. Jeffrey didn't do this. Jeffrey's a nice guy, right? That's not Jeffrey, and that picture's false. So I went to the defense attorney, Brian Brown, very good attorney, and I go, Where'd you, family wants to know where you got that. That wasn't entered into evidence. They, mm-hmm. that, that's, that's not him. And he said, no, that, that is a blown-up picture from his interrogation when the police came to pick him up after he called the police mm. and said he did it. So that's where that's at. Okay. Now, 
the jury's hung, but this is weird. I don't know if you've ever heard of it or Gary or Mark. They've been deliberating three full days. The, the trial's gone on over a month. One of the jurors says, I have a pre-planned vacation. <laughs> a pre-planned vacation. And the judge dismisses the juror. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to judge anybody, but when a justice for a woman, right, is on the line, compounded by the fact that you may or may not have the right man fighting for his life. Mm -hmm. I'm not going on vacation, right? but the judge allows it. Then yesterday, they're dismissed early. Why? Because another juror had a doctor's, doctor's appointment. appointment. Yeah. We can't do the doctor's appointment next week. The doctor won't understand. I don't understand that. I don't understand. I've never heard of anything like that. And then today, there's more. They're not there because one of the jurors' babysitters has a doctor's appointment. I, 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 you ever heard of this, Gary? No, I haven't. And having been on the wrong end of the justice system, I tell you, I never heard any of those things. <laughs> okay, and then our courthouse isn't owned by the county. It's owned by a billionaire. Dan Gilbert now owns it, right? And it's not being upkept. So yesterday, it was in the 90s, it was mm -hmm. muggy. The air conditioning of the courthouse broke down. The weeds in front of the courthouse have not been mowed. There's no respect for the public square here, mm -hmm. right? I'm talking to one of the bailiffs. They stopped vermin control. There's mm -hmm. rats running around mm -hmm. the courthouse. What, what is this? It's just, it's blatant negligent and nobody seems to care. I, it's been normalized. I think people are just almost accustomed to people not doing what they're supposed to do, to receiving We're substandard down. service, um, lack of consideration, lack of respect, lack of courtesy. And that's who and where we are these and that, days. That's why I wanted Gary to hang out because mm -hmm. it's, it's at all levels. Now, I'm hanging out there, dude, as I want to do. I know how to work a courthouse while a jury's deliberating. A couple of ladies that work victim services, right? They're leaving. Their caseload's over 1,000. We're talking homicide victims, domestic abuse victims, <laughs> rape victims. They're making 20 bucks an hour. So does McDonald workers. Right. So I said and to them, what's that? And they get dental. And they get dental. Wow. Yeah, so I'm talking to ladies. Is it true? Because the, mm -hmm. the, the authorities, you know, those running stuff, Gary, say, yeah, about 400 people accused of sexual assault. That's rape. And, mm -hmm. you know, about 400 are on um, tether. They're out. But according to cops I know and the ladies that deal with the victim, it's well over a thousand. So to tell me... You, well, this is a comeback. It's a lie. But everything's safe, Charlie. We've got growing population. The, the crime is down since the 60s. We've got increased wealth. The housing stock is up. Everything's perfect. What are you talking about? Who, this is utopia. <laughs> who, whose wealth is increased? That's what that's we want to find out. That's the narrative. Yeah. that, And you mentioned that narrative. We, that's what we're living yeah. here is a narrative yes. and the reality contradicts that my wealth's increased yeah. because i work with luke nowacki at pinnacle <laughs> wealth strategies at 248-663-4748 for sound financial advice okay now and, and then finally just because we were talking before the show just about elections and stuff mm -hmm. and um so i went to um election training this weekend as you know i i worked the polls the absentee You're the captain weren't you? i was the captain in 2020 no 150,000 ballots were trucked in. And there's an easy way to verify this, folks. Like, I can't talk Pennsylvania, Gary, because I, I don't like when media or reporters overextend themselves. I do my work. I let those in Philly do their work, and then we can sure. compare the work. Sure. The way you know that 150,000 ballots did not come in at 4 in the morning is real simple. There's a computer that I, the captain of the board, Mm-hmm. The envelope containing the ballot gets scanned. There's a timestamp in the computer when these 150 came in. They didn't come in. You can track when each one came in, okay. right? <laughs> By the end of the night, the number of envelopes should match the number of ballots. That's called balancing the precinct. And sometimes me, the guy scanning it, I missed the scan. I'm tired. I've been there 16 hours. Mm -hmm. I thought it went beep. And it didn't go beep, and I handed it to Wanda next to me, and then we processed it. The vote is legit. It's being tabulated. Human error. Mm -hmm. I didn't scan it right. So I, I go to training, and there's no computer. And I ask him, I go, 
where's the computer? He goes, we're not using them this time around. I go, why? Hmm. He said, because the software hasn't been certified. So I'm not quite sure what that means. So I asked Karen Dumas, Gary. Karen was basically the deputy mayor of Detroit. Karen was the one trying to land this airplane as it was going into bankruptcy, right? So right. Karen is a really super connected. I go, do what you can do, Karen. And what did you find out, Karen Dumas? Well, first I was asking about the tabulators because I didn't have a clear understanding of what you, and so I asked. The tabulators, the machine. Right, the machine when you, you insert, your ballot in right, it, when you go to vote. It. And so when that question was asked, well, first of all, let me say this. I, I personally called the city clerk's office. I said, let me, as a resident, let me just pick up, call the helpline, call the office on the website. It says, hey, if you need like help, any have other questions. Citizen would do. Exactly. Nobody answered the phone. I mean, any of the numbers I pressed, one, two, three, five, seven, nobody answered. So I said, okay. I knew somebody that knew somebody, and so I called them. Um, and they asked a person. They said, no, the tabulators you know, are intact. And so when I got it clarified, I said, no, I need to know this. They asked them again. They didn't respond at all. So I asked someone else who knew who could reach out to the Department of Elections. Again, the tabulator question immediately responded, yeah, we got it. The second time was uh, the clarification in terms of the electronic. Uh, about three hours later, they responded, you know, to my person and just said, you know, yeah, they're they're intact. Um, I do want to say that I did reach out to the county clerk's office and I did get an immediate response. And they just said that those, mach you know, that those things are intact for the upcoming election. They're not. That was it. They're. It's called the electronic uh, voter file, right? Right. And it's, it's, a, it's a backup. Okay, so when you mail in or drop box your absentee ballot, it goes to headquarters, Detroit mm -hmm. City Clerk. They're going to input it and give it a stamp. Okay. As a backup, when it comes to me, I input it. So at the end of the so night, you, you print the receipts. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is how many votes we had. This is how many envelopes we have. Now they're just going to be hand counted. So there's no, it throws doubt it's into it. Right. And again, I'm not able to report to the public when each of these things were actually tabulated. It's four years later. I, I don't see how this is improved. And I think the reason they're doing it is most of the people that work these elections are older oh, people. people. They're right. sequestered. You got to be in there for 15 they're hours. Tired. You got to bring your own food. You're tired. And if... If there's one more ballot than there is envelope, the precinct is considered out of balance, mm -hmm. just one, mm -hmm. and it can't be recounted. So I think what they're trying to do is take the human error out, but there's no double check, and there's no, there's no surety. But Charlie, this is the thing. It's, uh, this, is, this is 2024. We've been talking about accuracy. Uh, we've been talking about integrity. We've been talking about vo voting the uh, purging the voter rolls, just the whole nine yards. So we, we've got driverless vehicles. <laughs> we've got people hanging out in space because they can't come back and they're fine. We've got all these things that indicate that technology has taken us far ahead. What is the problem with being able to have a process in place where there is accuracy in voting? I know. Go ahead, Gary. Oh, you know? They Tell us. Accuracy. They don't want accuracy. They want to be able to do, they want to be able to back a station wagon up, a minivan full of manufactured ballots and have nobody question it and have no way, the next day when somebody says it happened, no way to prove it. That's now, what they want. Now see this. That, and that's not a conspiracy. Well, the, the, the powers that be, I want you to listen to me. Gary has served this country his entire life. Gary is a open-minded guy. Mm -hmm. Gary's a patriot little p i don't like when people call themselves patriots that's a title bestowed upon you by others little p little p right. okay so gary little p look what he just said they you're leaving him to imagine mm -hmm. right just like the incident in pennsylvania with the sniper when you don't have agents up there when they're within the perimeter and, and, and sloped roofs you're leaving us to wonder reasonable people what I'm saying is I need to be the middle arbiter here as the reporter. Gary's starting to suspect you're backing up trucks. There was video from 2020 at TCF where they're backing up trucks at four in the morning. And I happened to be there. 
And I go, there wasn't 150,000 ballots there. There was about 10,000. I know because I got one of the boxes with 11 ballots in it. And it's electronically marked when I inputted those. If you remove this extra little layer, you increase doubt. And what we need to do is decrease the doubt. But do you see the parallel to the trial? Reasonable doubt. And as long as there's reasonable doubt, <laughs> then you can't rest assured that the outcome is fair and accurate. And that takes us out to remember how we started the show. Gary Byrne, Secret Service agent, protector of presidents of the United States, said the government's bloated, it's ineffective, and it's all about contracts and jobs and nepotism. That's what needs to change, and we all agree, except if you belong to the bureaucracy or the parties. Think for yourselves, folks, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Gary Byrne, for being with us. Thank you. Take care. All right, brother.